morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. This is Paul Sisler, and this is In the Moment. Hello, hello, hello. Today on Tuesday Takes with L.R. Evans, we have a special guest. Luke, how are you today? I have had a very hectic day. Let me just put my earbud in. Um, my day has been hectic because I got a a nail in my tire. I did. There was a nail. Thanks again, Matt Kuhn. <laughs> um, anyway, though, yeah, I totally got a nail stuck in my tire, and my brother-in-law had to come help me and pay for a new tire for me because I'm a broke bitch right now because I am moving tomorrow, so I've spent all of my money on rent and U-hauling and all sorts of other shit, so I ain't got no money. <laughs> But luckily, I was around family, and the family helped me, and I have a new tire on my car, and everything's fan-fucking-tastic. So, anyway, that's why I was late to the live. I know that freaked you out. Did <laughs> you freak out when I'm, like, five minutes late? <laughs> and now uh, I'm like, no, no worries. Was, you're good. See, I already had a comprehension of what was going on, so even if you didn't show, I was good. So, Where again. is my J? Did J bounce on me? No, J's here. Oh, Jay's okay. here. We just haven't got to him them yet. And oh, okay. I, I, I just had to announce that the person that we're covering today is the one and only J.H. Colts. Hello, Jay. Hi. <laughs> Great to be back. Yes, yes. I hear you have some awesome news for our viewing audience. It's finally out. It's finally real. And honestly, it feels very surreal, but... It exists now in physical form instead of its strange sort of metaphysical form. Anyway, <laughs> here it is with the uh, logos and all. Castle Carrington, website. It's a whole kit and caboodle. And it smells like chemicals. It's great. Yes. Yes. Loving it. Loving it. How many books did you get on your first batch to you? Um... I was sent uh, three author's copies. One of them's already spoken for. Um, so one's for Luke. I'll get that out to you eventually. It's here. Uh, we, we did kind of like a, a little swapsies, you know. I got Luke's here. and Well, you know, even trade. Yes. Mm. Yes. I love Excellent. it. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Now tell everybody where your book can be found. Um, it can be found on the website itself um, at Castle Carrington. Don't know if you, you can't see that at all. I'll just read it no. out. It's Castle Carrington Publishing, one word, dot C-A, because it's Canadian-based. Uh, along with that, if you want to deal with something a bit easier, but at the cost of your soul, you can buy it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Um, just type in Magnify. It's a made-up word. Nobody else should have that. So it should be pretty easy to find. Yes. I just bought my copy just a little while ago. I was talking to Luke and while I had Luke on, I purchased it and I sold my soul to Amazon. So yes, it was a great, it was a great trade. Well worth it. Ah, well, thank you. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So tell everybody a little bit about your book. Um, God, that question always chokes me up, but um, essentially, um, it is as whimsical as it is tragic. Secrets and Songbirds provides a deconstruction of the hero's quest, as well as a character study of the human condition. It is a dark fantasy that follows 10 diverse LGBTQIA plus characters who hold uh, unique ideologies. So... It, it dives into, you know, mental health issues and what can happen with um, trauma responses when dealing with, you know, the whole world being fantasy, magical. Everything will probably try to kill you, or if not, the magic will. All so. right. All right. Give me a little insight as to some of the characters and who, who and what they are. Because. Crossifer, 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 Crossifer. I want to hear about Crossifer. Can you tell me a little bit about Crossifer? All right. Uh, yeah. 
So Crossifer is uh, in this world known as uh, a Diabolis, which is essentially um, half fiend, uh, half something else. But um, they are despised. They are seen as uh, criminals, as uh, ne'er do wells, as trash, the trash of society. So because of that, there's a lot of discrimination towards them, not just on the humans or, or the, the regular civilian side, but also uh, religious persecution. The church has taken it upon themselves to uh, inflict this this notion that they're all bad. So Crossover deals with that, but he's also a songbird. A songbird in this world is known as a more commonly like a bard. So songbird equals bard. Uh, so they, they make their living that way, performing for people, singing, telling stories. But um, Crossover personally is also uh, kind of plays the role of the villain that was given to him at birth because of the way that he is. So yes, he, he will resort to stealing at times if he has to. And this world kind of makes you play those roles. Nice, nice. Now when you say religion, is this a religion you've created or is it based on the religion like we have right here and now? Or is it like a crossbreed? Um, like all good art and media, I think that it takes aspects of reality and the way that we perceive our own reality and interprets it into art. So it's a little of A, little of B. They do have a pantheon of gods, though. So it's not monotheistic. It's polytheistic. Okay. More like the um, Greek and Roman gods. Mm, I would say so. Very similar to that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Looking forward to this. Looking forward to this. Tell us a little bit about some of the other uh, types of characters. I mean, you, you mentioned what Crossifer is and you mentioned humans. Are there other types of characters? Oh, yes. There are all manners of um, races and creeds and such. So there are humans, which... Um, are probably the most prevalent, especially in this part of the world. Um, there are light elves, elves of uh, golden skin, golden eyes, and golden hair. And then there are death elves, elves of grayish, bluish skin, pink eyes, and raven black hair. Um, dwarves, dwarves of, um, well, they distinguish themselves based on um, the hair color. So there are the um, fire hearts, red hair, uh, the golden hammers, gold hair, and the, uh, what was it, the violet scales. Those are more akin to death elves, so dark uh, grayish skin, um, you know, pinkish eyes, so very small little distinctions between them. Um, there are also orcs. Orcs, who, who doesn't like the green skins? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. A little now, bit of do, you, do you stick to lore on these? Um, I kind of created my own lore. So each one of them was designed with a specific sort of background and history and uh, course traditions. So depending on which one you're asking about, they vary in traditions. Okay, okay. Luke, you were about ready to jump in. I saw that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, of course we all, thank you. We, Of course we all like uh, the orcs. Our favorite orc is Thog. Our welcome back present to Jay after they returned from their long vacation of three days in San Francisco after we just met you. <laughs> and we, we were going through withdrawals because the J was gone from Twitter spaces. <laughs> so we all wrote fan fiction, is all I will say. I won't, I won't, um, I won't extrapolate on, on the subject. <laughs> good, good, because just so you know, my grandson popped into the space, so. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's up to Jay if Jay wants to. No, there are children it further. present. There are <laughs> children present. Not in front of the kids. Not in front of the kids. 
<laughs> not in front of Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh no um my favorite is crossifer and you like i haven't even read the entire book yet i know i'm in the dark now but whatever deal with it uh <laughs> but um I-, I haven't even read the whole book but crossifer is such an interesting and compelling character to me and i've only heard uh jay read certain excerpts uh about crossifer and from the two or three excerpts that I've heard, I fell in love with Crossifer. So this is a really strong character. I feel like all of Jay's characters are very strong, very well-written, very voicey, very voicey. And that is something that Jay gets a lot of praise for uh, from anyone who's read their work before in the past. Uh, they always say that like they have a favorite character, Tenebris or... Eleonora or Thog, <laughs> Thog, <laughs> um, or you know, mine was Crossover, which probably means that I'm mentally damaged, but that's fine. But I think that's a testament to how well you write, Jay. I appreciate that. I tell you, I still can't get over the first time I heard you read. Um, I, I think it was uh, Crossover and Eleonora up in like this dark cave or something or this dark building. I can't remember what it was, but um, they're, they're being tracked by this uh, monster. Um, and then this demon and the description you give of its claws and everything. And, you know, it was just like, that was like, that really spoke to me because the whole time that you were reading it, I was envisioning and living it. And, when he couldn't see anything and didn't know where the beast was, I, I just, with my claustrophobia and everything that I have and the panic that set in, my heart was racing when you were reading that because I was, you know, ugh, everything was closing in on me. But very, very descriptive. And it's one of the first pieces that I heard anybody read on Spaces in the writing community and it's uh, it, it's something that really motivated me to want to know more about writing. So um, I would not be here interviewing you right now if not for hearing you read that one section because I wouldn't have probably taken up this inspiration to write as I have now without that. So thank you again, Jay. I appreciate that. It means quite a lot to me. <laughs> I see it, Jay. It's the only one that inspired you. Nobody else. Got it. I'm not jelly. You're jelly. <laughs> Jay was the first. Jay was the first. And Luke, yes, you're right. He was very inspirational. Vicky, Diana. There's just so many people that I've heard read that it is. It's very Cornelia. My God, I, I've got I've got your guys' books on Paul, my show here. Paul, quit. Quit panicking. I was just playing. I was joking. I know you are. <laughs> Paul just goes I, through everybody that he knew that he knows. <laughs> like, oh. Uh. <laughs> no one's feelings will be hurt today. God damn it. Yes. Daigle. Daigle. I love Daigle too. <laughs> <laughs> Some random person that you haven't talked to in like two months. I love them like, too. Oh, yeah. Not me. I see how it is. <laughs> No, no. Um, but our community has a lot of really talented people, and I, I tell you, it, it is an amazing thing. For those that don't, you know, that don't utilize the writing spaces on Twitter, you need to because you're going to find a lot of very, you know, very talented people reading a lot of things, poetry to short stories to uh, chapters out of their books. Um, Please, you, you just you got to join us on the Twitter writing spaces. Jay, you are working on a sequel right now, aren't you? It's going to be out in March. Yes. So excited. How how long is this book series? Says the nine. person who already knows. Nine, nine books. Nine. nine I already so, have a contract signed for the second one so i i'm gonna release the second one next year in march so jay did this uh story start out as just like one book or um and like you knew like the beginning the middle the end or did 
you decide to expand on it after the fact and it just kind of like became something different like how did how did it become a nine part series was it always going to be a nine part series originally it was just supposed to be three just three books um but the problem was that the first book as i was working on it um was already getting way too long so in order to like you know reach that uh 120,000 and not over it i had to cut the first book in half uh and then cut it again into a third so yeah now i have to do that for every other book but the first one was just going to be this massive fucking thing and it wasn't even going to be called secrets and songbirds like i i the whole everything had to change <laughs> what was the book initially going to be called um, from white to gray. And then the next one is going to be from gray to black and then from black to white. Oh, wow. So it was going to be full circle. And the reason it was going to be called that is because, um, from white to gray was the first book because, um, it was just going to focus on Tenebris, just on Tenebris through Tenebris's perspective and all that. But then as I started developing the other characters, I felt like they were, like they needed more instead of just being seen by one person's perspective. I wanted to give the reader the perspective of each character that was crucial in turning Tenebris into what he will become in the last book. Wow. Wow. So why, why secrets and songbirds? Um, because, um, so Tenebris has a familiar who is a little red cardinal, um, that gets mentioned in the like second chapter. Uh, but also songbirds are bards. It's the name that people call those that sing songs, songbirds. So it's, it's, between, it's a play on that, on the fact that you should pay attention to the little red cardinal and tenebris, but you should also pay attention to those who are singing because both of those have their secrets. Okay. I love it. I love it. And of course, you have some Easter eggs too, don't you? Yes, a cipher, which starts off, oh, you can't see it. Well, the closer I get, the darker it becomes. But there's a little little beginning of a code there. Then when you go to, let's say, chapter four, there's, again, another little bit of the cipher there. I'm not sure if you can see that, but... Throughout the chapters, and only specifically in the chapters that begin with the title Tenebris, Alpharius, or Eleonora, is a different piece of the cipher. If you go through the book and you start piecing it all together, you'll realize, and this will be an exclusive for you, I haven't told anybody how to like start decoding it, but take those first bits of each chapter. Each one of them is a word, and they all start off with this first word, Okay. So, so Crossifer isn't important enough to get a cipher? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Like, Crossifer's Cross chapters just don't get one? Crossifer <laughs> doesn't have any chapters. Oh, that's right. Sadness. He doesn't. They were all cut out and repurposed into the second book. <laughs> so, in the second book, Crossifer is tied for having the most chapters with um, Salvador which is a different character who doesn't get any chapters in this book either. Ah. And what what part does Salvador play? <laughs> Salvador, yeah, also known as Sal, is Mel's oldest brother. And Mel is another crucial character in the first book. Um, they do get chapters in the first book as well as the second book. But um, Salvador is... Um, the eldest son of the emperor who dies in the first book. So Salvador inherits oh. the empire. Oh, oh, we, spoiler alert. <laughs> A big one. Yep. Trust me. Jay could give you all the spoilers in the world and it still wouldn't ruin the book. Right, no. right. Because it's so intertangled. It's... But. I'm... It's the characters. It's a very character-driven story. Like, there's plot. Don't get me wrong. But it's the characters. 
that really draw you in and make you want to continue reading because you care about them as soon as you open the book. Like, I love Tenebris. I've read chapter one and chapter two. That's what I've read. And already I'm like, I must protect this child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Tenebris is an absolutely broken character, but that's what you get when you're raised by a vampire who only studies necromancy. So, so we also have vampires in this book? There is, oh, only two, only two vampires. I won't tell you who the second one is, but I'm pretty sure you can piece it together if you read the first book. Okay, so we have vampires, we have elves, we have orcs, we have dwarves. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But see, that one sentence just now that Jay said, that's what happens when you're raised by someone who is a vampire that practices necromancy. Like, if that's not a hook to fuck to uh, actually wait, this is in the moment I'm allowed to fucking read the book. I don't know what is. <laughs> right. So we have a question from Cornelia. So which was your least favorite character to write and why? Oh, um, to write? I, I love writing all of them. I, all of them, they're all great. They, they honestly, they make for good characters to write about. Now, do I like them personally? No, I fucking hate all of my characters on a personal level because they all exhibit these traits that you're like, holy shit, that's fucked up. <laughs> but if I was given the opportunity, I'd probably do the same thing. They, they're meant to be a mirror for the worst aspects of humanity. Uh, you either pity some, or if you can relate to them, then I'll pity you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you yeah. coming for your Crossifer stands right now? Is that what you're doing? Crossifer's a monster, and I hope you know that. I love him. I know. The weddings in fall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God> damn it! <laughs> I, I can't. No, there is there is one character, one character who I would absolutely want to protect, and it's the same character that Crossword would want to protect, and that's Mel, because Mel is the only beacon of like innocence and actual decency amongst the rest of them. Like they all have their like such toxic traits, whether it's dealing with trauma through substance abuse or being manipulative, or just being downright pathetic and in love with their own sadness. It's these kind of traits that it's like, wow, oh my god. Same, but fuck you. Tell us a little bit about Mel. Like, uh, how, specifically, when we first meet her, how do we meet her? Like, uh, what's the scene, the, her opening scene in, the, in Secrets and Songbirds? You get to meet her when the rest of Team Nero, which is Alpharius, Eleonora, Diamante, Crossfer, and everybody else, um, first walk into the tavern and meet her. You end up finding out that this is the apprentice that Crossfer mentioned to Alpharius a few chapters ago. And she is just sitting at the tavern uh, reading a book, not partaking in any sort of alcohol, not, you know, any, anything else, just sitting there waiting for Crossfer to return reading a book. Would you call her your Mary Sue character? Or does she have any flaws? Um, no, her flaws are the fact that she is so innocent. In a world that is just covered in bloodshed, greed, deception, the fact that she is so innocent makes you either, one, want to protect her, or two, just completely take advantage of this person. Is she... Is she like a damsel in distress type or is she able to protect herself? I don't think she's given the opportunity to actually protect herself. Okay. Oh, because Crossifer is there. Yeah, because Crossifer is the one that has taken it upon himself. Like, I must protect uh, this child. This, this person is like the only one that was actually halfway decent to me while I was working as the uh, Imperial Fool. Because that was Crossifer's job originally. So... You know, okay. but the relationship doesn't uh, evolve beyond the uh, sort of, um, I, I guess, sort of 
protector aspect. It's just like, this is the person I will protect. And that's it. That's, that's like the, the depth of that relationship, you know, just friendship. So I must ask them, since Mel's never given the opportunity to protect herself, is there the possibility that down the road that she will be on her own in any way, shape, or form, and we get to see a different side of her and an adaptation of change to where she's just not that innocent anymore or that naive anymore? Yes. Um, yes. I'm not going to spoil the ending of this first book, but there's a great shift in that which leaves it open for the second book. The second book is where I begin to develop like, hey, you're literally on your own right now. The only person you are stuck with is Tenebris, and Tenebris is not going to save you. Tenebris is a coward, an absolutely broken and damaged person thanks to their upbringing. So you have to start relying on yourself. And um, Duke Kane, the Duke of uh, Ravenmore, ends up teaching her like, hey, this is how you use magic. This is how you use this. You need to start developing those skills and move forward beyond just sticking your nose in a book. Yes. But you know, I wouldn't discount her book learning though. She must be oh. a very smart person if she reads a lot. Is it? Yes. I'm sorry. Very much so. Like, um, she's like probably one of the only ones because of her upbringing, she was able to develop those skills. Like her initial plan was well, I'm the youngest. I'm never going to be the emperor of this kingdom. So I might as well just move to the College of Mages and learn magic. So she was already starting that kind of journey. And, well, I mean, being uh, a child of the emperor allows you more access to knowledge that others wouldn't know. Like, you know, the provinces and um, the people who rule said provinces. I'm giving Paul a second because I don't want to keep monopolizing the conversation. Oh no, you're you're fine. You're fine. I just, for some reason, I feel like we're gonna find out that Mel is like this badass vampire that just you don't want to cross because it. <laughs> oh oh oh! Mm. Not a vampire. I I will clarify that now. Not a vampire. Ah uh, ah. Uh. I do like that she was a child of the emperor, though, because that kind of explains why she would be kind of sheltered, kind of mm -hmm. like used to not having to do anything for herself, so to speak. And that you do give her a character arc um, at the uh, in, in book two um, and that she's not completely without skills in book one because she has learned a lot through books um, to make her like an asset to the team and she's not just dead weight that's constantly having to get saved which i didn't think you would do because i know that you're a strong writer but i just wanted to have that discussion here on the live so that you have a chance to like explain more about this character that you like this cinnamon roll character and and put any of those ideas to bed on the live that she's a mary sue or that she's a damsel in distress type shit you know what i mean <laughs> definitely not uh and the, the real development comes in book three. Like, the, the journey is set off on the ending of the first book. The development happens in the second, and the third one is the payoff. Very wow. nice. And then there are six more books after that. So by the time book mm -hmm. four comes around, she's going to be one of the major players that's probably like fucking everybody up. I mean, she must know so much magic <laughs> by book four. She, she must be like super leveled up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Especially since that's where the journey is going to be taking both her and Tenebris. It'll be taking them to the um, evergreen forest to find the Tower of the Mad Mage. The Tower of the Mad Mage. Right. See, and that prologue threw me off a little bit. Like, I thought that was the Mad Mage, but it's not the Mad Mage in Secrets and Songbirds. It's, um, oh, shit. Why don't you explain? Explain a little bit about the prologue. It's the very beginning of the book. It's not going to spoil uh, anything. Okay, so the prologue actually takes place, like, hundreds, if not, yeah, hundreds, almost thousands of years before the actual story takes place. And it uh, follows Ian Blair, which... Ian is the second vampire. 
So there are only two. That is it. Uh, so Ian essentially is stuck on like uh, the Sulphur Island in his own tower. And Ian is like this. You'll find out later in the development because I'm only, I only give Ian one chapter at the very beginning. The second book has another chapter at the very beginning. The third book is going to have the final chapter that has Ian as being the prologue. The next series of three books, different different prologue, different type of thing. Because at the third book, that's finally when Ian's story catches up with our main story. And he, because he's immortal, he finally lives the time long enough for the rest of the story to make sense. And then he moves to actually start being the primary antagonist to everybody else. And I literally mean everybody else. Pairing him with um, the uh, stigmata dragon, it, it just causes the greatest nuisance the world will ever see. How long is your prologue? One chapter, maybe like, let me see. I feel like it's shorter than most of the chapters. Like it's it's pretty brief to actually read. I'd say maybe a thousand words. Mm, give or take. Uh, it's only let's see. That's seven. Yeah, it's like eight pages. That's it. Wow, that, that's a long prologue. Well, see, I usually skip prologues in all books. It's just my thing. I always skip the prologue. In in Paul's book, I'm going to be skipping all of the acknowledgments and all that good stuff at the beginning, too. And what you'll learn from this book part, I'll skip past it and read it later if I want or something. I usually skip past it, but I don't feel like I'm going to be able to do it with Jay's book. Like I feel like I'm going to have to read it because I know that it's going to be a continuing story over the next three books. So you've enticed me to read the prologue and pay attention. Yes. Well, see, there's well, Easter eggs in my prologue, and I bet you there's Easter eggs in Jay's prologue. So, okay, you can skip the prologue. You can skip the prologue in the next book as well. But the issue that arises from skipping the prologue is the prologues actually give you a little bit of understanding how our world works in comparison to this world. Because Ian, through the Twilight Slumber, has been able to live multiple different lives to the point where he doesn't know if he's still sleeping. And this is another dream. He sees our world as a dream that he woke up from and woke up into this world. So he's able to actually give an account to the dragon, hey, so in this world, they kept time like this versus in our world, they keep time like this. So if you're smart enough and you can do the equation, you'll realize how to kind of understand the time in this world versus that world. Hmm. So if you're a big nerd like me, that's that's part of the fun. You gotta so read the is, prologue. Is our world um, referenced at all in your book? Or or, do, do... Only by Ian. Ian's the only one that actually has knowledge of other worlds being a concept, which is why eventually Ian becomes the main bad guy. He doesn't see anything or any worth in any reality anymore because he has been in so many different realities and he has seen the wheel turn so many different times to the point where he's going to be the destruction of this world if nobody stops him. Oh, shit. That's going to be fun. I love it. I love chaos. Do it. Yes. Apocalypse <laughs> now. I love it. I love it. I love it. I mean, I don't want the world to end, but I do like the threat of it. Like, get me a Thanos. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I, I like that you kind of bring reality into the story, too, a little bit. Like, oh, yeah, you know, this is just another world. It actually exists. It's just not our world. So <laughs> I, I like stories like that that make you think, like, huh, I wonder if this world does exist. Like, The Witcher did the same thing, um, where, like, there's all the different spheres, and it makes you think. You're like, I wonder if maybe I'm just in a parallel universe and the Witcher universe does exist. <laughs> and then oh. I can go and, and make... Make smoochy faces at Geralt. <laughs> so, so when he has these the slumber, this dream, is it just strictly that a dream, or did he live that life? Ah, uh, okay. So, the Twilight Slumber works um, based on uh, just a few primary rules. One, the living cannot use the Twilight Slumber; only the dead can use the Twilight Slumber. So, because Ian is an undead. 
he is allowed to go in there and then still wake up. It's it's like passing on to the next life, if you will. That's the essence of the Twilight Slumber. So he goes in and then he wakes up reborn in another life and then experiences that life until he dies and then wakes back up. But the problem of it is because he has been in the Twilight Slumber before, there are laws of the world that some things are inevitable. So the things with Ian that are inevitable, that are written within the caution records for his life is that one, no matter what reality he exists in, he will always end up becoming an undead, a vampire. And two, because he was the one to find the twilight slumber, he will find it again in the next life. So he ends up becoming a vampire, finds the twilight slumber, and then goes to sleep again in another world. So he just keeps doing that in an endless cycle until it finally reaches its climax and then he starts waking up tick by tick back into the previous reality until he's ended up back here. Oh, wow. That is a deep concept. I can see how Tenebris and his training as a necromancer with his father can play in here. I, oh, I'm does. thinking some undead people, like he raises some dead, raises the dead and like sends them to find the Twilight Sumbler or something. I don't know. I don't know, but somehow it ties back in. I know it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Absolutely. And it will, which is, again, that's why I, I like introduce all these little things. But now keeping in mind that Tenebris is the main character, you start clicking like, oh, all this shit that happened is eventually going to fuck over Tenebris and or he's going to start interacting with it. I love it. <laughs> I'm super Gosh. excited. It's going to be so fun. Wow. I am more excited about this book now than I've ever been. Oh, my goodness. I have been I mean, wanting to read it myself. I just, I I wanted to read it last night, just binge read it. But then a bunch of stuff happened. Like, I'm getting ready to move, for those of you who don't know, out there in the YouTube-verse. So I didn't have time. But I wanted yes. to. I really wanted to, Jay. And it's all right. I got to finish up the Rainbow t um, Prophecy before I, uh, Blood Schism, before I uh, jump into any books. And I think I've decided I'm going to go with Rainbow Prophecy, and the first book is going to be Blood Schism, and then each book's going to have its own name. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yes. I will. I'm going to read Jay's book before I start writing mine again because I'm I'm at the stage now where I need to go back through and rewrite and rearrange and stuff like that before I can move on because my brain just won't let me write the rough draft anymore so i have to do some editing before i can move on well you just but, spent a whole month in nano ritmo and exploded your brain so i can understand you're sitting back and reading now yes <laughs> and that's what i plan to do after this move i'm thinking probably like friday or saturday i'm just gonna sit fucking veg out and read this book that's what i'm gonna do just enjoy myself and I will be texting you, Jay, <laughs> every time I find something like, oh, my God, I can't believe this just happened. Fuck this bitch. Oh, my God. It's going to be like my me live tweeting Breaking Bad, I swear. <laughs> and and I, I got a question for you, Luke. Uh, how many words did you write in November? 35,000. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hit my nano. Like the streak got broken and my ADHD wouldn't let me continue. So <laughs> I only did it for 17 days. <laughs> Still, the fact that you got 35,000 words down, I mean, that's just, that's awesome. I mean, it took me almost four years to write 200,000 words. So, I mean, it's like 50,000 words in a year. So, I mean, you basically <laughs> almost wrote what would take me a year to write in one month. I, I'm I'm proud of you. That's that's a, that's a lot of writing. Thank you, Paul. Jay, how many words did you? No, I'm joking. I'm playing with you. Sore subject. Only ten. Only ten thousand. <laughs> I play with you. <laughs> yeah, but you wrote ten thousand good words. I wrote thirty-five thousand. Let's word vomit on the page. So, I mean, honestly, who did it better? <laughs> You I kept all yours. I, I didn't. Got about a thousand <laughs> words in. I, I only wrote about another four pages. I and I, I don't count words like you guys do. I use uh, pages on my uh, Mac, and mm -hmm. each page I equate to about two hundred and fifty words. And I only got about four pages in, in, in actual writing. So, 
I commend you guys. You guys are writers. Aw, you're too sweet, um, Paul. I almost called Paul a J. That's that's different. Um, but Jay, uh, you used NaNoWriMo to work on the second book, right? Any teasers for us for the second book? Anything you want to share with the whole wide world? Oh, yeah. Um, let me see. One. Uh, two. Uh-oh. Three. These are deaths, aren't they? Four deaths. I knew it was death. I knew it was. Anytime that I count like that, it's me counting up how many people I killed. <laughs> Four. Four people die. If Crossifer goes, I quit. Just so you know, like, I'm done with the whole fucking series. Like, sorry about it. I'll buy them. I won't read them. I'm just rereading the first two and that's it. <laughs> that's fine. Don't worry. It's it's not Crossifer. I'll say that. Okay. He doesn't die. Okay. Yeah, you're going to have to do a part where it looks like Crossifer dies. So Luke's looks like, no, no. No, I will rewrite it. I will rewrite it. I will drop everything I'm doing with the Rem World trilogy and just go on fanfiction.net. Like, anyway, and then Crossover almost died, but then he didn't. And then this happened. And I will just continue to write. Oh, the cipher. The cipher tells you who dies. Uh, the cipher will tell you the end of the whole oh. series. Oh, okay. Is there enough in the first book for us to figure out how the whole thing ends? Or do we need nope. more clues from the other books? Yes. Okay. But if you decipher it and then read the first three, you'll start getting an understanding. Like you won't, some of these won't pay off until like, well, Tenebrises won't pay off until like the fourth book, give or take the fourth book. But um, once you decipher the cipher and then read the fourth book, you'll be like, son of a bitch. That's what that meant. Mm. <laughs> That'll be fun. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to try and do it. It'll be fun. I want to see if I can figure it out first. If I'm first, do I get a prize? Well, you're already getting a signed copy, so I, I don't know what else I can give you. A hug. <laughs> All right. That, that works. Yay. My prize is a hug. Go me. I'm getting the hug. Nobody else. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Let's see here. Who is your least favorite character? The character that you fucking hate and you wish that you could stop writing, but they're too important to the plot for you to actually kill. Um, that is a good question. It's kind of a toss up. I want to say Sal. Oh, yeah, Sal. Salvador is a real piece of shit. Mm, I noticed. <laughs> yeah. but people won't understand why I hate him until the second book. Right. And I'm not going to say anything because it's the second book and I'm not spoiling shit. But yeah. <laughs> I got a question for you. Do you have any characters that you created that you didn't put in the book and you're glad you didn't or you wish you would have? Um, I can't say that there is. I, I only put in characters that serve a very specific purpose. Um, I kind of saw it as like, if they're not necessary, then I... I'm not going to put them. And if they are, then I have to put them, even if I despise the character as a whole. No, uh, you said it was a toss-up between Sal and another character, but you didn't mention the other character. Who's the other character? Um, I have a bit of a disdain for uh, Eleonora. Uh, I haven't met her. Like, I, I've, I haven't met her in the read-through yet. I've heard you talk about her a little bit. I know that the scene with Thog... And where Thog's pissing on the wall was uh, with Eleanor and that's like the only time that I really got to interact with her at all in Twitter spaces when you read so I don't uh, know much about her why do you hate her so because she's just so rude 
like ah. blatantly rude. And I understand that it comes from, you know, a place of like traumatic experiences. So you need to push everybody away before you get too close to them so that you're not hurt when they leave or die, which is what her whole shtick is. Like that's that's been her whole trauma. People either leave or they die. So she preemptively is just the worst to everyone. Mm. Uh, so at the same time that you hate her, you also pity her. Oh, I pity all of my characters. <laughs> That's one thing Jay does with all the characters in their book. They make it to where, like, all the characters are shitty and toxic in some way, but, like, we all understand where why the characters act the way they do, and we can empathize with them at the same time. We're right, like, you're not right. going about it the right way, but I understand why this, why you act like this, and I feel bad for you. And it's it's kind of like, it's kind of like Jay wrote a whole fucking book of villains that are pretending to be protagonists. And I love it. <laughs> well, I mean, her title uh, in this world, um, if you want to be a hero, you join up and join the Heroes Guild. But the problem with them is they are heroes in name alone. They don't act heroic. So it kind of <laughs> spits in the face of like what you would think a hero should be. They are not. Eleonora is an absolute dick to everyone. Uh, and most other heroes, they just, they, they're killing for money. Like, they're mm -hmm. sent out into the world to go and deal with something someone doesn't want to deal with for money. And it's just the greed of it all. It's tarnished what a hero should be. Kind of like the show Boys. I oh, it's that. a good show. It's a very good show. Everybody else has. Okay. Um, so, basically, they're... <laughs> They're not heroes, they're mercenaries. Guns for hire, yeah, that's it. They are mercenaries, they are bounty hunters, they are sell swords, <laughs> they are anything but what you would think a hero should be. Because to me, a hero goes out of their way to do good for the sake of good, not expecting any sort of compensation, not expecting, yeah, my God, just the worst. Like, they don't have, like, a moral obligation to do the things that they do. They have a, a, a monetary motivation for it. So it's, yeah. it's not like, I'm going to go and save the child because the child is a child and I love child and I shall protect child. It's more like, I'm going to go and protect child, but only if you give me 50 gold. <laughs> give me the 50 gold. Your child is burning alive. It's that they're going to stay in the burning house. Okay, thank you for the 50 gold. I saved the child. That was a fire alarm going off, wasn't it? Your house caught fire <laughs> as I was talking about a burning house. That is funny. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're Whoa. okay. <laughs> they're fine. It's probably just their mom cooking. <laughs> That's funny as fuck. <laughs> that was hilarious. I loved it. Perfect fucking oh my timing. God. Burn it down. As, <laughs> as Jay would call it, cosmic comedy. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm excited. Sure. I can't wait to read this. I got to finish mine up first. Yeah. I've kind of put mine all a little bit of back burner myself, so I'm going to be able to actually sit down and and read it. Uh, probably this weekend. That's probably when I'm going to read it. Just sit down, take a second, recover from the effort of the move and the muscles and all that being all sore, which will happen. Anyway, though, Jay, you've returned and your house does not seem as though it is on fire. So yay for you not being a flame. Yeah, took, took care of that. But, uh, fuck, where was I? Oh, Jay's a flame. Uh, yes. <laughs> but, um... Right. The heroes. The uh, the only person that actually thinks heroes are heroes would be Thog. Wow. Thog is our um, new initiate uh, into the Heroes Guild. And he still has these rose-colored glasses when it comes to the Heroes Guild because of the stories that he was read as he was growing up. And... You know, of course, the stories that are told in this world are um, just marketing. 
Heroes Guild just throws out these stories and paints the heroes in a heroic light, even though they don't have a single ounce of heroism within them. It's just greed. I love it. I love it. Of course, now, Fog tries to be a hero with a belief of what the heroes are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, at some point, if I'm not mistaken, he comes to realize that it's all a lie, doesn't he? Mm. Kind of. Uh, so the issue that ends up arising is that he ends up realizing that there are heroes who are not heroic, but he internalizes that and wants to be the exception. He will go on the rest of his life trying to be a hero. And um, you will see what that results in book two. All right. I think right now Fog is probably my favorite character. Should be. He's a great man. He's honestly a great man with a very, like, high notion of what he should be and what he should represent as a hero. A towering man. Yes. Great tower. <laughs> great tower. We'll leave it at that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, let's see. Ooh. What are the ships? And they don't have to be like like the cannon ships, but what are your ships? Like, who would you put together if, like, you could and it would make sense to the plot? Mm. Or what kind of fan fictions would you like to see written ship wise? Because I'm all about the yummy, yummy. <laughs> who would I ship? Mm. They're already kind of like, um, somewhat canonical ships, which would be Alpharius and Diamante, um, also Tenebris and Mel. Uh, most people like the ship of Eleonora and Thog, but I, I don't see that ever working. <laughs> I think I would much rather ship Eleonora with Crossover. You said you hate Eleonora. Why would you do that to my Crossifer? Because I think that they are so toxic with each other that it could, it would work. You know what? (laughs) Two terrible people for two terrible people. I agree with that because in book two of my shit, like I'm not making it about me, but in book two of my shit, I, I have the toxic character getting with another toxic character and it's fucking hilarious. I love writing this shit. So I get you on that. Like ship, I will ship Eleonora and Crossifer in my fan fictions just to watch it be funny as fuck. I'm going to do it. It's going to be so great. <laughs> There's going to be so much fan fiction. It's all going to be by me. <laughs> there is a, a little instance where they do get to share a night together but it immediately blows up the next morning. <laughs> Crossover and Eleonora bump uglies? Um, it's implied, but... Okay, uh, fade to black, I, but I that's that, fine. I can follow the blanks. <laughs> I, I leave that up to everyone else. Uh, personally, canonically, no, I would say that nothing actually happened. That um, Crossover is too damaged in himself to actually bear to that sort of intimacy. And Eleonora, well, being drunk as fuck, probably just passed out. So, no, I don't think anything actually happened. No. Well, I'll, I'll still play with it in my head anyway. I like the ship. I, I, <laughs> I need to learn more about Eleonora, though. I can't wait to read this thing. So what's Crossifer's toxic traits? Um, that he's an actual monster. That's it? Like, I can work around that. What else? I, I mean, all right, spoilers. To anybody who doesn't <laughs> want everything fucking spoiled, please tell me now. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Save um, it, save it, save it. <laughs> yes, I, I, I want to be surprised when I read it. Save it. All right, well, you'll be plenty surprised. Yeah. Well, hello, Teapaw. 
You're going to do my man like that? You just lying about him. I'm just going to assume that the writer is lying about Cross for whatever something comes up. Be like, nah, my boo boo didn't do that. He lying on you. Yeah. They're lying on you. I know that. It's okay. Luke's going to be so disappointed when Crossper dies in book two. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kneecaps. Not in book two. Kneecaps. Oh, not, not in book, book two. two. Oh, 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 oh. Well, Wait, all right. What? The unfortunate part about this world is that, yeah, at, at, at the very end, there's going to be a time skip between book three um, <clears throat> and book four. And then there's another time skip from book six to book seven. So there will be jumps in between them. That's how I originally had it planned out. But, you know, semantics, it doesn't matter. So you got to understand that some of these people in this book, if they don't find a way to achieve immortality, then yeah, they're, they're going to die of natural causes. I love it. I love it. I love it. So basically, by the time you start getting up to book seven, eight, nine, um, those that don't achieve mortality will no longer be there from the original. Mm -hmm. And there will only be echoes or offsprings or legacy that affects those books. So they may not be there physically, but if they make a long lasting impression or have offsprings or whatever their legacy might be, you can still see that echoing through the time. Okay. The only person I can assure you will make it all the way to book nine. Yeah, book nine will be Tenebrous. You don't even like him. No, I don't. But, <laughs> but you're going to let Cross... Started. You know what? You didn't say that Crossford was one of them. You just said that maybe. But still. Well, you're just going to have to read all nine books to find mm -hmm. out. Shut up, Paul. <laughs> 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 I'll come for then your you're going to have to wait to see that. what his children grow up to be. You know what? I don't want to talk about this anymore. You guys made me depressed. So <laughs> I quit. <laughs> this whole story is supposed to be depressing. Like you end up realizing how broken these characters are, and you end up realizing how fucked the world is. Like it sounds on paper like great, awesome heroes, mages, dragons. Wow, this is this is going to be great, and and then no, it isn't. No, it isn't. This is depressing. Yeah, anytime that there's people, it's depressing. I like it that it's fun. dark. I like it that it's dark. You know, um, all of my writing is going to be dark, and I don't care what people say. So, I I, I love dark too. Yeah, I, I I love the darkness. So, because to me, darkness is the reality of the world. You know, whatever world you're going to delve into um I i'm sorry um there's darkness and th there it is i don't like I think, that, but, I think but, okay. that the um the reason that oh how do i word this i think that writing about darkness isn't about writing about darkness it's about writing about lessons it's about writing about ways to cope with shit that happens in real life so when you when you write dark shit it's about the healing process it's about learning how to cope how to get over shit stuff like that i feel like that's that's why we're drawn to dark writing because it shows one you're not alone you feel seen you feel validated and also it kind of provides a kind of cathartic um a kind of catharsis as well because like it's showing you that these people have overcome these horrible things that maybe you've um encountered or something like that and and i think that's why we enjoy writing darkness so much i would agree i know i kind of went on a tangent but <laughs> i think it's somewhat therapeutic to write about these dark things i i I want people to take away from this. Yes, it's bleak. Yes, it's dark. And yes, it's damned. But to be able to relate with those broken little things, those creatures, it can be therapeutic. It yes. lets you know that you're not alone. And it allows you to heal alongside with them. Yes. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's what I love about the darkness and all that. You know, Uh, I see the darkness as a period of learning. And when things aren't quite so dark, you cherish those good times even more. Well, that's how it should be. Yep. Yep. Well, Jay, I am just so thrilled that your book is finally published. It's out there. Everybody check it out on Amazon. Get it on Amazon. Go to uh, Castle Carrington Publishing. Um, order your book today. It's I even though I haven't read it, Jay has read different chapters. Um, and just from what I have listened to, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Um, the, the parts that I've heard are just phenomenal. I mean, just mind-blowing phenomenal. You're an awesome writer, Jay. Um, I hope you sell a million copies, brother. That's the dream. That's the dream. All right. Well, any more questions, Luke, before we head, uh, head on out? Uh, no, I think this was a really great uh, session of talking about secrets and songbirds. I learned a lot more about it that uh, piqued my interest, and I'm super excited to finally have time to sit down and read it all the way from cover to cover, because I know I'm going to rage quit so many times. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any closing thoughts, Jay? Um, buy, buy this book. Buy this book now. Go get get over there. Go buy this book. Yes. Go buy, buy it. it. Go buy All it. Right. Definitely All right. buy it. Remember, everyone, be kind, be happy, and may good things come your way. Thank you. Meow.